So it was an incredible thing that is it it like a message in a bottle I sent out onto the ocean and it floated back up on the shore of my island in 2008. It was an amazing coincidence, but I, I wrote that letter and then forgot about it. I, that was a period where I was so desperate just to be working that I was having 10 ideas a week and thinking, just throwing, you know, poo at walls and seeing what stuck. And that one didn't stick, but it did eventually. Tim Minchin was first pigeonholed as something of a musical comedian, but he's so much more than that. Also an acclaimed composer, lyricist and actor, his vision helped create one of the world's favourite musicals, Matilda, which swept up 90 international awards, including seven Olivier's, after opening in 2010. The musical has now been adapted for the big screen, starring the likes of Emma Thompson, Lashana Lynch and Stephen Graham. So, Matilda by Roald Dahl is set to continue capturing the imaginations of children around the world with its tale of an abused girl gifted with a keen intellect, a love for reading and telekinetic powers who uses her superhuman skills to overcome the cruelty of her unloving parents and sadistic headmistress, Mrs Trunchbull. Uh, I'm delighted to say that Tim Minchin joins me now. Um, Tim, welcome to the programme. and enor- In fact, welcome back. Um, a- an enormous night for you last night. The film opened the BFI's last London Film Festival. And I was thinking um, when I was watching it that in many ways it is the sort of perfect film for our times. There's triumph over extreme adversity and the revolution of the powerless. Do you think that there is a, a timeless message or indeed a very prosaic message for now? I, I think there is. And I think it is timeless. Whether you want it to be or not, there'll, there'll always be room for stories about people who have the moral clarity and the bravery to rise up against uh, despots. Um, I mean, it, it, I mean, it, it sounds sort of petty to try and make to draw a parallel between a, a cute film and what's going on in the world. But I, I literally came out of the screening last night and saw on my phone an image of girls in Iran wearing school uniforms, shot from the back, giving the finger to a picture of the Ayatollah, and I was. It just, I mean. As I say, I, I, it would diminish the very real struggles in Iran to make it uh, parallel to our film, but it, it felt like a scene from the film of kids literally revolting against uh, someone whose ideas and whose intent was to keep them caged and trapped and uh, repressed. So, yeah, unfortunately it resonates horribly well. And that's, uh, in a way, I mean, the element, the timeless element of the story, isn't it? Because, you know, I know what you're saying and, you know, it can be tried to to draw those parallels. But actually, I left uh, the screening of it just thinking, you know, the, the, the messaging at the moment is so dire from every quarter. And I think it ends up making people feel cowed and disempowered and I, I know it's crazy but to, to, to come out of a film thinking yeah the little guys can win you know really really does feel like an important message at the moment I think it does and it's it's interesting to reflect on how it's aged as well the, the story of Matilda I mean it's unashamedly anti anti-intellectual you know it's as was Dahl's original book Dahl, for whatever you think of the, the sum total of Dahl's work, he 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 hated trashy TV and loved books and he was unashamed in his fight against anti-intellectualism. And when we made the musical, that felt hugely important. Between Mrs Wormwood and Miss Trunchbull, you have Trumpian sort of characters. Mrs Wormwood, in a song which is obviously satirical, says what you know matters less than the volume with which what you don't know is expressed. She says you've got to be loud. And and it, it was quite, some of my lyrics in, in Matilda the Musical are quite strong eviscerations of a modern notion that the the screaming passion with which you say things is more important than old Enlightenment values of thoughtful uh, intelligent inquiry, you know, and so so there's tension there. There's, there's, it, it really, I still think very deeply about all these things, the balance between rebellion, between just outright defiance of the sort that we're seeing in Iran right now, which is so incredibly necessary. But on the other side, in 2022, we have tidal waves of just you know, you know, shouting call out culture from everyone speaking only from 
the point of view of their own identity, where everyone is rebelling all the time against anything that they see as a hierarchical structure. So it, it evokes in me all sorts of complicated thoughts, and which will probably bore your listeners to sleep, but still. Not at all. Our listeners are very interested in complicated thoughts. That's why you're the right man for our <laughs> That's TPM why I interview. get to talk to you, yes. Um, do you think it's also uh, got darker the film in terms of some of the darker themes being pulled to the fore? Or do you think that we look at it slightly differently now through the prism of society today? Because, you know, in, in the introduction to you, I sort of said uh, about an abused child. I don't think I would have said that after the, after the stage play it, with the same degree of vehemence, perhaps. Um, and, and and I suppose, you know, along with that, the, Mrs. Trunchbull was always played by a man uh, uh, in the stage play. Uh, but now you've got Emma Thompson, uh, you know, in, in prosthetics trying to look uh, like the man who originally played Mrs. Trunchbull. So, you know, all of those differences, fluctuations in, in how things are perceived seem to be incorporated and perhaps prove challenging when making the film. I think so. Uh, I, I think it's actually simpler than that. It's just when you are close to characters, you can no longer retain a sort of helpful two-dimensionality. So what Roald Dahl was so brilliant at was lightly addressing the real darkness of life. It's literally that Scandinavian thing. You you know, the Hansel and Gretel, going all the way back, is a story of two people abducted and murdered or potentially murdered by, by a, you know, by a, a psychopathic woman or something. But uh, there's that grand tradition of, of, of dark, dark tales that, that get to shine a light on, on our lives. And Dahl was always able to create children who were were treated terribly were orphaned or you know incarcerated or abused or and and it's sort of people have been thrown around and locked in things and put in cupboards and then he'd sort of say the next day there was a parrot you know and so he was always able to just keep it light whilst being dark and on stage that is it's quite easy to do because there, as you say, there's pantomime-esque, although Matilda the Musical is definitely not a pantomime. There's even in the fact that Miss Trunchbull has always necessarily been played by a man because of the physical things that that part requires on stage. You need to be, we cast people who are six foot tall and they have to physically throw a child round uh, by a harness and jump over a thing. So we tend, we've always cast a man. And, but that adds to that old tradition of pantomime dames and, and there's, a, there's a cardboard cutout, a wonderful artistic cardboard cutout feel to the musical. Once you get a camera and you have someone singing like Lashana Lynch, which just breaks my heart, singing, this is my house. She says, um, still there burns a small but stubborn fire and it isn't much, but it's enough for me. And the camera is right on her eyes. There is no escaping the personal. So that distance that both Dahl and the stage musical allowed us from the truth of the pain of what was going on, you just don't get to have that distance anymore because the camera is in the performer's experience. And so you, if you're going to make a feature film, you have to accept it. And, and so, yes, it's, I find it emotionally intense. But what Matthew Watchers, the director, has done so well is it has this magical realism, this, this chaotic circusy kind of otherworldliness so when you land on those emotional moments that make you sob you're sort of sat in a in a in a not quite real world so it just makes it a little bit more bearable but there's no doubt the movie is emotionally intense i did sob actually uh, with the acrobat and the escapologist scene i won't go further just in case there is anyone left in the world who hasn't seen yeah. some version of of, yeah. of matilda and um, how much has it changed since I think it was 13 years ago, nearly 13 years ago that you were first asked to get involved uh, writing the music for Matilda for, for the stage version by, by the Royal Shakespeare Company. I, I, my memory is rubbish. So are there extra songs in the film? I, I, I wrote one new song for the film. Uh, I was skeptical about doing so. It's, it's quite traditional that if you put a stage musical into a feature film mode that you write a new song. And I think that comes from 
quite cynical places that it's good for publicity to write a new song and it means you, you um, Americans love an award so if you want to be nominated for an award it can't have been written for the stage it has to have been written for the you know if you want to get Oscar nominated for a song so there's all these sort of nefarious motives very and, important considerations yes. from the and producers. as you can uh, exactly and as you can imagine me being incredibly stubborn I'm like nope uh, you know, it doesn't need a new song if it needed a new song I would have written it in 2008 you know but of course uh, I was wrong because uh, a theatre show has a bow. It has a curtain call. And the end of the theatre show is the curtain call. There's all these kids on scooters singing a reprise of When I Grow Up. And, it, and everyone's clapping and standing and there's paper planes and confetti. And, you know, um, you don't get that in a movie. And the film actually really needed a closing number to tie a ribbon around the thing. And so I got to reopen that sort of paint palette and it was joyous and I'm, I'm quite it it feels like it needed to be there all along of course a movie has to be shorter than a stage show as well so things got cut and that's a whole other conversation that's really really difficult but I think again Matthew has done an amazing job yeah how invested were you able to be in the film for emotional reasons well I mean Dennis Kelly had to rewrite the entire script because a movie and, and a stage play are very different. What you can't do when you trans, transfer or, or, or translate a, a stage show to a film is change the songs because people would be very cross with you because they are they, kids have listened to it in their cars since they were four, you know. Um, so, so you're you in a position of privilege. Yeah, I'm just like, good luck with the movie, guys. <laughs> and um, sadly, I was in Australia and I couldn't get to it. I, I would have absolutely love to be on set I mean I would have just been on set being a cheerleader and you know running around telling people I think they're wonderful uh but I would have liked to have any opportunity I have to stand anywhere near Matthew Watchers when he's working for me is is a learning experience I, I will gladly take but COVID kept me in Australia so I was really I met Lashana and Alicia and Stephen Graham and everyone yesterday for the first time um so it's been a no long way. time coming but I was involved in a lot of the discussions about how we shorten the songs, what we cut, and eventually in the big the fights that you always have to have where there's tension between producers and commissioners and artists where they're like, mm, we don't think the viewers are going to like this and we have to defend our work and um, let, let our work go. And so I was involved in the politics of it too, <laughs> whether I like it or not. But yours aren't, um, they're not just songs. They're really what shape the characters uh, in this story, and I know that um, I mentioned that it was 13 years ago that the RSC asked you to to get involved, but I think Matilda was a project that you've been invested in for even longer than that. I mean, you were quite obsessive about wanting uh, to adapt it, weren't you? Well, uh, it's certainly the story that's ended up you know floating about, but <laughs> no, news. not not at all. It's just an extraordinary coincidence that in 2008, when Matthew approached me about this, I. I, it was just a really weird coincidence that at some point in about 2000, I had written to the Dial Estate about, you know, how I might go about getting the rights to write a children's musical of Matilda. And but but I was in Perth getting paid like a thousand bucks to write songs for for kids theatre. I, I didn't when I wrote to them, I didn't mean can I write the version? I meant, can I just do a little version that will go on for two weeks in my hometown and then never be heard of again, which is what I was doing. I, I, I had written a dozen scores by then that had will never be heard of again. Um, so it was an incredible thing that is it it like a message in a bottle I sent out onto the ocean and it floated back up on the shore of my island in 2008. It was an amazing coincidence, but I... I wrote that letter and then forgot about it. I, that was a period where I was so desperate just to be working that I was having 10 ideas a week and thinking, just throwing, you know, poo at walls and seeing what stuck. And that one didn't stick, but it did eventually. Just before we move on to talk about other things, in terms of the, of the songs, you said that the challenge was, you know, to keep it light while being dark. Um, which song from the musical all of them beloved by audiences around the world which one do you think most achieves that or which is the one that, that that you feel most sentimental about well when i grow up sort of the obvious one that gives the audience two different experiences depending on which side of adulthood they are so kids just see it as a cute song about 
you know, what it might be to grow up. And grown ups, it makes them cry because it's a song about loss of innocence. It's a song about the fact that when we grow up, we, we don't do the things we promised ourselves we would do. We, it's just much, much more complicated than we realized. And that makes us feel nostalgic. Um, I think, um, I think my, I, I, I think quiet is the song I'm kind of most proud of just because it's formally quite different from, from your normal halfway through the second act number. And because it puts yourself really inside the head of a person who really in common, in modern parlance, we would describe as neurodivergent. And I'm very aware of that now because since I wrote that song, I have had dozens and dozens of letters over, over a decade of parents or of autistic kids themselves or parents of autistic kids who are not necessarily capable of writing letters talking about how much that song means to them about the the noise the the visceral sense of having a head getting way too much input and then finding quiet and uh so i think i i, I know that's a diversion from your question about the dark and light of it but um that that's the song that is kind of closest to my heart especially because as it turned out my kid turned out to be on the autism spectrum and has battled with uh the the troubles of overstimulation when you're when you're neurodivergent so it's 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 weird actually how much that song um has kind of landed back on my doorstep yeah and how much you got it right because i have to say that would probably be my favorite song but also the the scene that evokes it in in the film is is astonishing i thought really really moving tim you've joked about we've been talking about about matilda you know saw away success catapulted you to to global stardom you've in the past joked about your 20s saying you were a, a jack of all trades master of making no money so <laughs> tell me tell me a little bit about your sort of career path uh, you're from Perth uh, originally I mean did you have a sense because there are so many strings uh, to your bow to use the cliche did you have any sense of, of what you wanted to do and do you do you do you now uh, no I still have no idea I think um I I, I always loved playing music I, I'm I'm really self-taught mostly in everything I do I never you know, did a script writing course or an acting course or a comedy course or a composition. You know, I, 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 I just really love the kind of um, intellectual challenge of trying to make stuff work. It, it, it all, for me, art feels like problem solving in a way that I, I, I find really exciting. Um, I guess in my teens, when I started figuring out I could make my fingers move fast on a keyboard and that if I did that at a party, girls would talk to me. I, I quite quickly got addicted to um, uh, the affirmation of being a performer and all that stuff. But I, I always, I, I wrote music for theatre from quite young as a teenager. I liked being on stage, but all my friends went off to acting school and I just don't know why, but I just didn't even cross my mind that I could be that person. I, I think it's a bit about... Um, I know this is ridiculous, but I just I just knew I didn't look like the people on the telly. I'm not I'm just not like my friends who went to acting school were really handsome, basically. And I think I thought, oh, that's for handsome people. And 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 because I wasn't trained, I thought, oh, I love writing music for theatre, but I'm going to hit my head on a ceiling at some point, and because I can't be a proper composer. So I I had this weird love of doing it, but not a not a particularly high self esteem about myself. And I, I wasn't brought up to think like that. Anyway, I've been brought up by people who love me very much, but certainly don't go on about it. And they certainly don't say things like I'm proud of my children and aren't my kids special. I mean, the opposite, you know, so I just didn't, I didn't have big dreams. I just really hoped at some point in my 20s, I thought, I hope I can do I have to step off at some point and go do a vocational degree? Like, I really wanted to be a teacher and things like that. But somewhere in my 20s, I went, oh, maybe I can just do this. Maybe I can just make theatre and write songs. And so by the time it happened for me, I was almost 30. And I don't think I had quite realised that I had accumulated a bunch of skills that weren't as common as I thought. Basically, coming from Perth, you're kind of in a bubble and you're not, you don't know what you're comparing yourself to. And I was playing in cover bands till two o'clock in the morning, playing keyboards in a cover band in Melbourne where they wouldn't even let me sing because they thought I sort of, I don't know, like I had, a lo I had enough uh, evidence that I wasn't special so that when I started doing things in the UK and everyone went, 
no one that that's no one else is doing that i went oh really <laughs> okay um so yeah I, I had a lot of self-belief but not i didn't envisage my name in lights yeah you sound pretty self deprecating i wonder um as a parent now yourself whether you, you believe in that kind of dream squishing form of parenting um you know because i suppose in a way it, it can encourage a, a rebellion against it and a determination to be more than the sum of of what's expected of you but on the other hand it can be quite destructive um though i suppose also give you an insight into into other people's humanity that is such an interesting conversation starter and a, a very interesting way of framing the question because you do as a parent my instinct my instinct give, because of how I was brought up is to especially because my kids are so privileged by so many things uh, to, much to my surprise mostly because of Matilda we you know we're well off and my kids go to schools that we pay for and all that stuff I, I am dedicated to making sure they are humble and aware of their privilege and uh, I'm quite no nonsense you know because that's how it's my culture and I do I don't dream squish but I certainly don't think I don't find it moral to tell your kids they're special because it implies other people are less special so you know I'm from that school of thought however when my daughter at 13 had a massive crash and got depressed and eventually diagnosed with being on the autism spectrum, a psych I, got, I had a moment, and I hope this isn't too personal, I don't think my kid would mind me talking about it because she's a, you know, she's a, an autism advocate teen. Um, but I had a psychologist say, your daughter has no self-esteem and you need to fix that. And I went, oh God, what have I done? But that's because I didn't know that she had a slightly different brain. So we've had to start again and build her up. But that's absurd to me because I grew up never being told, I've never heard my mum say, I love you. Violet's been told I love you 80 times since the day she was born every day. So I, I'm, I'm a bit confused about how to do this, but my kids are really great now. And I, I think we've got the balance right now. They know we know they're wonderful and special. And my daughter's brain is fantastic. And they know I'm a huge fan of them, but they are also taught that they are not special. They are not special. They are people who have to earn whatever they're going to get through hard work and humility, you know. I think the thing about parenting is that um, you never get it right. You just, think there is no you're right. You're doing really well. Well, um, because your kid is your kid and you didn't know them until you know them, you know. Absolutely. You've also made some sort of dramatic lifestyle changes uh, along the way. You, you were a comedian who became very successful. You toured arenas and so on. But you've spoken really eloquently about the reasons why you stopped those shows, part of it to kind of get away from the hedonism and avoid becoming egocentric. Um, tell how's me that gone? <laughs> yeah, how's that gone, Tim? That's yeah. exactly well, what I wanted to know. <laughs> I really didn't want to become a narcissist, but uh, here we are. <laughs> Talking about myself on the radio again. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I mean, obviously that is a kind of watershed moment in life to to, to kind of swerve and, 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 and change direction completely. Do you feel that you left a bit of you behind? I, I worry. I think I could have been a very good comedian, probably, if I had kept working on it. But I think I made the right choice to not just focus on being a comedian uh, I don't think I ever was a comedian. I think I was working towards it. I was really a cabaret artist with some good chat. I, I got very, very lucky. I went from very little cabaret rooms in 2005 to arenas in 2010 and then uh, with a symphony orchestra. And then I pretty much retired from that world. And I, I have framed it as a conscious desire to not... And I, I said no to hosting panel shows and stuff because I didn't want to be ubiquitous. I, I wanted to be able to be an artist and I, I always thought I'd like to act and I, I always thought I don't want to be a presenter because it's very hard to th then be an actor if you're a presenter. And I, I just want to keep all my options open and I don't think it's good for kids to have a dad who's stopped on the street all the time. So we moved to LA and I, I got more into composing and all that. And I, I like to define that as a moment where I step back from getting too famous and becoming a hedonist. But if I'm a bit more honest, it's actually ambition. I'm, I'm very, very ambitious, but maybe not in a way that 
one might think. I am ambitious. I would like to have a career like no one else has ever had. I mean, it's a big, it's ambition. I want to, I want to be able to go. No one has ever been a arena comedian, a musical theatre composer, a, a drama TV script writer, a, a published poet, a children's book author, and, and someone who can you know run ten k's in under forty five minutes. Like I'm that guy. I'm 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 quite ambitious, but not for wealth and not for drug experiences and not for the orgies. Just for uh, breadth. Well, you probably don't have time for all the latter. No, um, no. <laughs> honestly, I'm too I'm too tired for all the orgies I've had available to me. <laughs> So just finally, um, has Matilda the musical, uh, which is now opening as this incredible movie that I, I defy anyone not to love, has it um, turned you into a monster? Has it? Does it feel like something that you have to carry on your back and you're desperate to escape from? Or does it feel uh, like a, a kind of integral part of, of, of where your career is going now? What do you want to do next, I guess? I mean, look... It- you know, on the 21st of November, the second season of the show that I was the head writer on, a co-star of and producer of, goes on to Sky uh, Telly. On the 23rd, my, you know, streaming DVD version of my last tour back is released. And on the 25th, Matilda the Musical goes into cinemas. <laughs> I mean, and then my children's book, Sometimes You Have to Be a Little Bit Naughty, is coming out at Christmas. And I, I don't, I, I, I'm doing what? is next uh, and I've got a new TV show that I'm developing and I, I I need to get my life work balance better I'm working on that I I I'm uh I really but Didn't really... you already leave LA once to get your work life <laughs> balance better no, I know but I, it, it, I unfortunately you, I'm carrying my obsessive love of my work with me wherever I go um so it it's great but you know how everything most things come at a cost you know there's no such thing as a free lunch if you you know I think about my comedy career and what that gave me but um it it also took some stuff it it took me away from my family my wife had our baby in a London winter with no family around and I went off on tour and she almost you know almost broke her and and you know my my comedy my early comedy was quite edgy and kind of I don't love all that stuff anymore mostly there's a kind of a reckoning Matilda there is I can't see a downside. Matilda came into my life. I I had all this sort of secret experience of writing children's theater that no one knew about. I loved Roald Dahl. I fell in love with Matthew and Dennis and Chris and Peter and Ellen and Rob and Hugh and everyone and Denise and Andre. Uh, everyone I worked with on Matilda I adore still and success usually breaks up creative groups and we all love each other the musical has supported huge education charity stuff for years through the rsc plus it's allowed me the financial stability to do my own philanthropic stuff and give money to theater back to theater it puts these beautiful messages into the world i get letters every day from parents of as i say neurodivergent kids and people who say matilda changed their lives i just don't know if anyone usually gets to have something in their life that is just freaking good all the way down. It, it employs hundreds of people all over the world. It keeps the Cambridge Theatre shiny and new. It And now it's this film that I did no work for that is going to be watched every Christmas for 20 years. I mean, I just, I mean, can you imagine what an absolute blessing that was for me? And, and on a personal level, it gave me a belief that I can do more than comedy and changed my life. So, Well, I think we've seen that too. Tim Minchin, thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure.